Welcome to this evening's CEU course presentation. We're going to be discussing specifying glass lighting designs with Hammerton. I can't thank you enough for joining this evening. My name is Adam Case, president of the Home Design and Remodeling Shows, South Florida's largest home design and home improvement marketplace. Well, we're here at LBU Fort Lauderdale at this beautiful showroom with this amazing group of people. Yeah! Let's so before I make some more introductions, I want to invite you all to take a quick look at this amazing video to get you more familiar with who LBU Lighting is. Roll. I hope you enjoyed that movie, and that way you get a little bit more familiar with everything that LBU has to offer. I'm standing here with showroom manager, Tori, and you're gonna tell us a little bit more and Absolutely. introduce the presentation. Absolutely, thanks Adam. Absolutely. My name's Tori, I'm the store manager here in Fort Lauderdale. Thank you guys so much for being in person and um, attending online. We cannot thank you guys enough. I'm so excited to have you here <laughs> with us to go over glass lighting. There's a lot going on. Um, LBU, we've been in business for thir over 30 years. We've got recess lights, we've got bulbs, obviously. We can do all the decorative, outdoor, landscape, you name it, we can do it. Just come in and see us. Can't wait to see you in the store. I want to introduce you to John Howard, who's going to be over here, sorry. Um, he's going to be leading our presentation um, over decorative, uh, specifying decorative glass lighting and presented by Hamberton. Thanks, Tori. Hi, I'm John Howard. I'm with Hammerton Lighting, and I'm here to make a presentation tonight about specifying decorative glass lighting. But before we get started, I just want to give you a little history about myself and how I ended up in this business. I moved to Florida in 1980 to seek my fame and fortune playing professional racquetball. And I found out I would find neither fame nor fortune there. And so one day I had to go get a newspaper and circle the classified ads and actually go get a real job. So by the time I got home that night, six places had called me back to offer me a position. One was a surveying company, one was a little lighting showroom that I knew nothing about. I really wanted to go to work for the surveying company, so I called the man and I said, could I just ask you a couple questions? He says, sure. I said, what would I be doing? He said, well, you'd be the rod man, the guy that holds the stick up by the side of the road. I said, well, do you see very many alligators? He says, hell yeah. I said, how about snakes? He says, more than you can count. I said, thank you very much. Hello, lighting showroom? I can start tomorrow. And I've been in this business ever since. So tonight, on behalf of Hammerton Lighting, we're going to learn a little bit about specifying glass lighting. Glass is something that's extremely important. Um, it gives you a lot of design opportunities as a designer. And so you're going to learn a little bit tonight about the history of glass and how you can incorporate it into designs that you've got going forward. First, I have to mention that this is protected by U.S. and international copyright and patent laws, so don't steal this video from me, okay? Our learning objectives tonight are this. Upon completion of hearing my little spiel tonight, hopefully you'll understand the difference between glass that's made by a machine and glass that is artisan made. We're going to really focus on the artisan part of it. You'll be able to identify the different types of artisan glass and how they can be used in decorative lighting. On top of that, you'll understand the applications, the opportunities, and the limitations of each one of these types of glass. Why do we want to use glass? One of the really neat things about this particular picture is this is actually located here in Florida. That's at the Ocean Reef Club down in the Keys. 
And ironically, we have a board member for Hammerton who, is, who lives down there. So we've been able to do a lot of work down there. But the neat thing about glass is it really is the ultimate art artistic canvas. It offers uh, unbelievable possibilities of shape, texture, and color. You'll notice in that picture, that is a gigantic chandelier. It's about six feet in diameter. And it's about five feet tall. But visually, it doesn't take over the space of the entire room. You can still see through that to see the architectural details back behind there. So it gives the appearance of volume without, without mass. It also doesn't obstruct views or the light that's coming through it. I know a lot of you here in the showroom have clients that have beachfront properties. And the last thing they want is a really heavy chandelier that obstructs their view out to the ocean. Glass allows you to be able to see through that out to the ocean. So it creates that artistic statement without taking away a bunch of, of the mass of the room. It also gives you a tremendous amount of versatility in your designs. As you can see in this picture right here, glass design possibilities are really only limited by your own imagination. There is a difference in glass. I have heard multiple times, well, glass is glass. It all looks the same. It really doesn't. Once you can see the difference, what I'll show you tonight, you really, will really begin to understand and have an appreciation of the different types of glass. There really are two types of glass. There's machine-made glass and there's artisan glass. There is a difference. It really becomes about the visual characteristic of the glass, the aesthetics of the glass. And it also gives you a lot of opportunities in the artisan side to, to come up with your own types of fabrication processes, your own unique textures in glass. So we will learn all of that tonight as we go forward. First, a brief history of glass. I've had so much more fun teaching this CEU after COVID. And the reason is, I don't know about any of you, but I watched every show there was about the food that made America, the machines that made America, the men that made America, and how all of these things that we all take for granted every day, how they're all made. And one of the things you'll notice when you get to the, we get talk about flat glass, is it, it resembles a lot of how other things are made. But we do know this, glass was discovered approximately 5,000 years ago by the Egyptians. Once again, if you followed any of your history shows on TV, we know one thing about the Egyptians. They knew how to party. They really knew how to party. Um, there's nothing that goes on in this day and age that the Egyptians weren't doing 5,000 years ago. So what the story is, the common th theory of the glass being discovered was that great big giant bonfires were created by the Egyptian soldiers after they would win these battles. And I can only imagine they were on the beach, there was a lot of alcohol involved. And if you think about how hot these fires had to get, glass has to be around 2,000 degrees to actually melt all the elements together. So we're talking about bonfires that must have lasted for days and days and days. But these bonfires actually had three elements that make glass, ash, silica, and soda. Those three things combined with heat is what forms glass. Earliest glass that was found was actually blown glass, and it still constitute most of how glass is made today. Flat glass was never made until uh, originally they would blow bubbles, and they'd cut it open and flatten it out. It wasn't until later on that they learned the process of how to make flat glass. Another thing, though, that was very common in early glass production was that there were all kinds of caustic and cancer-causing chemicals in those things. Um, that is still the truth, the truth today, and as a matter of fact, if you go back to a lot of old pieces of um, crystal, they actually are toxic. California many years ago put a law in effect, it's, it's proposition, I think it's Title 65, that anybody that sells lead crystal, it has to have a sign on the door that you have a known cancer-causing agent. So all those old Waterford crystal things and like that actually do have bad chemicals in them. The safety of glass manufacturing is still something that's very much in, up in the air as far as how we allow it to be made in the United States. If you go back to the turn of the century, the rivers that flowed from Pittsburgh down along the banks of West Virginia and down through Ohio, at one point in time there were over 300 manufacturers of glass in the United States. There are now zero in those same locations. So those have all been moved to other places where the laws governing what we can ingest and, in, and be around have been loosened, but not in the United States. So there's very little commercial glass being manufactured in the United States. It's primarily more artisanal glass. 
Another thing about glass, when you hear the term crystal, most people think crystal is different than glass, but it's, it's not. All crystal is, is is clear glass that has a high lead content in it, and because of that, it can be cut into multi-facets, which then give it the appearance, like some of these pieces here, of the rainbow effect that you get with the light coming through it. So we have several different types of glass, but really the two most common are what are known as flat glass and what's known as blown glass. This piece I have here is actually a piece of acrylic, but let's just pretend it's a piece of glass. This is something that you would see in a door or in a window of a house. And when I talk about watching these other shows, uh, I watch the show about how they make Hershey bars. I watch the show about how they make plywood. And really it comes out the same way. You have a molten hopper of whatever is the material, and it flows through a long elongated funnel, and it comes out in a sheet, and then it goes down some form of assembly line. That's exactly how glass is made. The difference, though, is that glass like this, after it comes through, it then floats in liquid lead. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like something that would be very healthy to be around. So that's another reason why even regular glass like this is very rarely manufactured in the United States. We also have what we think of as, as blown glass. And if you think about things that we used to get all the time, a milk bottle, a wine bottle, a beer bottle. Those are all blown glass, but they're made by a machine. In lighting, typically in the past, you would have an outdoor fixture that maybe had a cut piece of just clear glass in it. Or we would also have inexpensive builder priced chandeliers that would have five or six or eight pieces of glass. Those were typically blown glass made in a machine. Float glass is something that is typically, as I said, it's used in windows, mirrors, windshields, it's, it's made in huge long sections and when they make pieces of glass, float glass like this, they can make it up to 100 feet long. And then as it's cooling down, they'll cut them off into pieces. It is, as I said, it, it goes through an entire thing of hot tin is what this actually floats on because it's actually lighter than the tin. So you have caustic chemicals that you're around the whole time. Um, there's something about float glass that is really not artistic. It's always the same, it's clear, there's no interest. It's basically something just like the windows to the outside of this building right here, simply just something to see through. When we get into machine blown glass, now you think about things like beer bottles or a wine bottle. And this is the same type of process as an art artisanal blown glass, except it's done computer controlled with heat and air. So short periods of time will blow the glass into a mold. That mold then can be attached to another mold and then even the bottom to the piece of glass, which is the third mold, can all be blown at approximately the same time, and then as, as it goes down the assembly line, it becomes one solid piece. But if you look at any beer bottle or any wine bottle or anything like that, you'll see a noticeable seam usually down one side, and then you'll also see a seam around the bottom, which is the bottom cap. Artisan glass, though, takes us to an entirely different place, and this is where I really want to focus on what we're talking about tonight. So with artisan glass, we actually have three types of glass. We have hand-blown glass, we have kiln-fired glass, and then we also have cast glass. Uh, the unique things about these are that the artisan can create his own shape, he can create his own mold. Uh, the glass itself, depending on how it's manufactured, you'll notice here in this hand-blown piece, it has what are called chill marks, and I'll show you samples as we talk about this. Uh, but the, there'll be differences in texture. There's differences in the actual thickness of the glass, and each of those characteristics affect how the light comes through that glass. The other thing that's totally unique to artisanal glass is that it's, no two pieces are ever the same. So when we think of, the first thing we think of typically, we think of hand-blown glass. I don't know why they use the word hand-blown because you're actually blowing it with your mouth, so I think it should be called mouth-blown glass, but nobody ever listens to me. So the process of blowing glass has literally been the same for the last 5,000 years. There have been virtually no improvements in how it's made. The tools that are used by the artisans are the exact same, but basically it involves this. You have an oven that has a, a I call it a vat, but the, the vat is where the molten glass is held, and the artisan will take and get a drop of that glass on his blowpipe, and then he will then be creating it and blowing it into some form of shape. It's also known as hot glass. When the glass comes out of the furnace, it's 2,000 degrees centigrade. It's extremely, extremely hot. 
tools and molds are used to work the glass. And then that bubble, that piece of glass, has to be constantly worked back in and out of the oven to keep it at the operating temperature it needs to be, to, for the artist to be successful. Normally, when we think of an artisan blown glass, we think of something like this. And this piece of glass is actually made by using something that looks like a repurposed wooden shovel. That's the only tool that they use. And an artist is blowing this and turning it at the same time until he gradually gets to the shape that he's looking for in a piece like this. The other thing that then this has is another piece of glass that's been wrapped around the outside. So after it's been blown to the size that he's looking for, then it will then go into another oven, which we'll talk about later, which is called annealing. But if an artisan sits down and makes 10 pieces of this glass, all 10 of them are going to be slightly different. They're not all going to be perfect. That's another thing that I think really adds to the inherent beauty of, of art, you know, art, artisanal glass. Sorry. The role of the artisan is really where we come to accept what we now know as art glass. Each, each person that ever blows a piece of glass has his own interpretation of what he's trying to create. And so if you look at this man here, this is, man's name is Luca. Luca was the head of the design or the glass department at Hammerton for many, many years. But it takes years to learn how to do this properly. The artisans cr can create unique shapes by working the bubble freehand. They can blow it into a wooden mold. Or now what we've created at Hammerton are a lot of metal molds. So for example, when we talk about blown glass, we know this is a piece of blown glass, but so is this. So this is a piece of blown glass that a mold has been designed to actually blow the glass into. And one of the things you'll notice in this piece of glass are the little swirl marks around the outside. These are called chill marks. And the reason that happens is the mold is basically at room temperature, which in a glass factory is really hot, probably 150 degrees. But the glass is about 2,000 degrees hot. So when it's blown into that mold, the analogy I always like to use is if one morning, we, one night we all went to bed here in the Fort Lauderdale area and it was 80 degrees outside. The next morning when we woke up, it was 20 degrees below zero. When we would open the door to go outside, the first thing we'd want to do is jump back inside. That's exactly what's happening with this piece of glass. These little circles are actually shock waves that are created by the hot glass touching the cool metal and it actually makes it want to pull back. The really unique thing about that, though, is each one of these, it's almost like a fingerprint, is going to be a little bit different. And when this lights up, it will show a really interesting pattern of light and texture and shadow on the ceiling, which we'll see pictures of later. One of the things that's important that nobody ever talks about when it comes to glass is actually annealing glass. Annealing is a term for cooling down. So for example, when this piece of glass is blown, the artisan will take it and they put it on a sheet and these sheets then get put into an annealing oven and what that does is it takes it from let's say 1300 degrees when it's still warm it will eventually slowly take it down over time to room temperature then at that point they can do work where they add a fitter to the top of it they can polish the edge of it or it can simply be packaged for shipping but none of that can be done until this product is annealed one of the things that's always a an interesting uh, process is in the beginning when we design new pieces of glass figuring out how long it takes to anneal that prop that glass when we get to a piece of cast glass in a little while you'll be shocked to hear how long normally this takes about a piece of glass like this would go through an annealing oven in a matter of three or four hours so they can blow glass it goes through the oven it cools down they can blow more and it keeps the whole cycle going here you can see in this picture several different types of blown glass um, I like to point this piece out because it doesn't look like this and it doesn't look like that. But this is actually also a, a blown piece of glass. Uh, anybody here a Bob Ross fan? The painter? I love Bob Ross. And Bob, Bob Ross never made a mistake. He always had happy accidents. This is actually a happy accident. Um, we had a factory tour in Salt Lake City and there were a bunch of designers that were walking through the facility. And Luca, who you saw in the picture a little while ago, the guy with all the tattoos on, was blowing a piece of glass. He's from Russia, by the way. And a designer ran into him, almost knocked him off of his little chair, and he got really upset, and he started cursing into his blow tube in Russian. Every word he knew. 
into this blow tube. He finally got done and he took a deep breath and when he did, all the air that was in the blow tube came out. And this was actually this in the beginning. But when the air was removed, it started to fall down like a paper bag. So later on, after everybody left, we realized, hey, we got something really cool here. Let's figure out how to, let's figure out how to do that on a regular basis. But this too is a blown piece of glass. So you've got multiple different shapes and things and textures and all that that are all still considered to be blown glass. And I apologize for having to keep bending over, but the next thing we're going to talk about is kiln fired glass. So if you start with a flat piece of glass, that's what all kiln fired glass is. Now this glass we call warm glass because it's only about 1200 degrees. It's not 2000, it's only 1200 degrees. But what you can do now with kiln fired glass is create all kinds of unique opportunities. So this is a piece of glass that started off as a flat piece of glass that had recycled what we call frit. Frit's placed over the top. It goes into these large ovens. You can see in this picture right here, you can barely see it. But these ovens are about four to five feet wide and they're about eight feet long. They're like a pool table with a lid on top of it. So they can compute, completely control the temperature, how long they're in, and they can even go through the annealing process in this same thing. So what they do with this is they start with a flat piece of glass. It's heated up just enough so that it doesn't melt the big piece of glass, but it allows these frit pieces to then be adhered to the glass. So now we've created unique texture in flat glass. We also can do other types of texture though. This is a piece of glass that has been slumped into a mold. It's kiln fired glass that's been slumped into a little mold that gives it these ridges in the glass. This is a piece of glass where we've fused two different pieces of glass together, a bronze piece of glass and a clear piece of glass. Then in turn, it also has been slumped into a mold that gives it texture. So each one of these opportunities take a clear piece of glass add color, add texture, or something which now gives us some visual interest. We also think about if any of you have ever owned a Tiffany lamp. Tiffany uses what's called art glass. And art glass is basically just taking two different colors of hot glass and basically rolling them on a table like you would cookie dough. And then as you see through it, you have two different colors. This is a little bit different in that this piece of glass is what's called a full fuse. We took a clear piece of glass and a white piece of glass and another slightly different colored white glass. And so you have three pieces of glass that have all been heated enough that they all have completely fused to each other. So these are the options that you have with a kiln fired glass. But what you can see in these pictures is you can go from a tack fuse to a full fuse. So you have texture or you have color. The firing schedules for these very wide, very really wildly depend on how much how big the pieces of glass are and how thick the glass is. But this is all processes that we've learned how to do internally to create unique pieces of glass. Then, after you've come up with a texture or a color or a shape, now this can be worked even more into slumping them into different shapes and, and things like that. So for example here, you've got a, a piece of glass that's tack fused, but now it's been slumped into a curve, so it'll fit into that lighting fixture. Here's a piece that's got the ribs that have been injected into it, and then that piece of glass has been curved around another mold. So all of these are done in these warm ovens, and the temperature operates between about 1200 and 1500 degrees. Cast glass is something that's fairly new, and a lot of you probably haven't seen much with cast glass. Uh, I think Hammerton was one of the first manufacturers that's really started to work in this world. But Cast glass is basically, you take a molten layer of glass, ladle of glass, and you drop it into a mold. In this case, then in the middle, we're putting frit, which is recycled glass in the middle, and then another molten layer of glass on the top of that. So in essence, what you have is now a glass sandwich. The really cool thing about this glass is it's, every piece of this is 100% different than the one next to it. You will see fixtures that have a similar look to this that are machine made. The ones over the table over there are a good example with the bubbles in it. 
That's basically a machine-made version of this. And what that is, is a, there's a machine that literally is just blowing glass through this thing and it's injecting air into it at the same time. And when that goes down the line, it's just it's like a long, giant piece of spaghetti. They just cut it off into the individual links. But that is totally machine done. There's no artwork involved in that at all. Um, cast glass is something that you're seeing more and more being used and in more unique opportunities. So this chandelier here uses a little bit different type of glass in that it's basically half of this. So it's the front side of this with the texture on the back side. That's called graphite. Um, granite. And then the uh, axis glass is this. So those are the three different types of glass. As I've gone so far, has anybody got any questions about the three types of glass yet? Okay. So what you also are seeing in cast glass now is we're taking little miniature elements. This is basically a baby version of this piece of glass, which is one of our best selling pieces of glass. We've made a baby version that's cast, and now we've incorporated this up inside of a piece of glass, something like this. So now what you're starting to see are things where we will have a cast glass with a blown piece of glass on the outside. We actually have a piece of, of that on display over here. So you've got two different types of glass in the same, in the same setting, if you will. I'd like to just show you some things that really will give you some inspiration about projects. These are projects that we've done corporately over the last few years. But this particular hotel is the Marriott in La Jolla, California. This was one of the first big glass jobs that we did as a company. Each one of those pieces of blown glass, and they're, they're, they're just one piece of glass, weighs about 35 pounds. They stand about that tall, and they're about that big around. So to blow glass like that, you literally have to stand on about an eight foot ladder with a really long blow tube, and you have to have assistance turning at the bottom and all that. But that's a really neat way to see how you can do some blown glass here. The next few pictures, believe it or not, are all actually from the same house. Um, we had a client that came to us that had just purchased a Dale Chihuly chandelier that was $500,000. It's a piece that has four different elements to it. The overall hang on it's about 15 feet. It's a giant fixture. And they wanted stuff that would complement but not be matchy matchy to the Chihuly stuff. So as you'll see in some of these pictures, for example, these little discs on the outside of that, those are basically a fused piece of glass like this. The black pieces of glass are actually blown black balls of glass. As you go to this next picture, this is once again all in the same house. You have almost a reverse pattern where we've taken glass that's had some form of a texture to it, and then you can see from the sculpture of the, of the flower, that's actually been slumped into a kiln oven into that shape. So you can take glass like this, and it can be in turn made to look like the leaf of a flower. I've seen pieces of glass that have been done into the shape of a, of a fish. So with this, you can really come up with some really interesting concepts. This piece of glass right here was actually the forerunner of what we now call our rock crystal, which is actually our best-selling piece of glass right now from Hammerton. But that was the very first version of that. So another unique thing a lot of times with some of these custom glass opportunities for us as a manufacturer is we'll find something that eventually will work its way into the line. I like to use like the designer, these designers that have couture lines. You'll see their Paris runway shows and they'll have some of the craziest things you've ever seen. And for the most part, nobody would buy that particular outfit or that dress that the model has on, but they'll take elements of that design and eventually that will become into the woman's ready wear line and you'll see it in Macy's and Nordstrom's and places like that. We're no different than anybody else. This is a really cool piece and that that is a giant piece of glass. Each one of those spears is about this long and that's glass that has been textured, colored, and then shaped into the point of that star. Here's a fixture that's just in our regular line right now, but once again, we're using something really simple. We're just taking a texture, adding a color, and it creates a really interesting visual effect on that chandelier right there. Another big piece, we do a lot of really big fixtures, but another piece that's just a full tack fuse. This is a really interesting fixture. We had a, we had a designer that literally 
scratched something out on a cocktail napkin and said, I'm looking for, if, all, if any of you remember when, when uh, fabric drum shades were very popular over the last 10 years or so, this designer had this idea. She wanted fabric shades that were offset from each other. And we thought, that's really kind of boring. Could we do this in glass? And she was like, yeah, that sounds kind of cool. What do you got? So they came up with this concept. We call this the crankshaft. This is actually at a home in Orlando. That fixture was the first version of that. We've done many more since. But basically what you have is offsetting drums. But instead of a hardback shade, we did it with art glass. And that's an absolutely stunning chandelier in person. Lastly, we go back to what we call the Odeon fixture, which is a con just a contemporary, sleek fixture. It's all LED lit. And that actually has two different types of glass. That has full tack glass on the outside. And then the inner panel is just a fused, textured piece of glass. When we talk about chill marks, this is, this, these, some of these pictures are going to show you what I'm really talking about. You'll notice the wall sconce on the right has that kind of starburst pattern coming out of it. That's from the light reflecting through the chill marks in the glass. Um, this is a jewel, really high-end jewelry store in New York City that we did the lighting on. But you'll notice on the wall sconce in particular how you pick up the, the texture and the shadow from there. Here's another home where we used a bunch of different of our gem glass. Once again, they're all chilled. It's hard to see in that picture, but you, you can a little see a little bit on the wall where you're getting some of that reflection. And then here's a hotel lobby in California that we did. And you'll notice as you're walking down the picture down the hall, you'll see above the lighting fixture that really cool pattern that's on the ceiling. Um, I have a fixture in my dining room that's basically this fixture right here, but it's a linear version of it. And if you're in the dining room in my house, and there's no other lights on in the room, the reflection on the ceiling almost gives you the appearance that you're underwater. It's just such a peaceful glow that you get from the light when it comes through the glass like that. Here's another uh, a big room in a conference room, and you'll notice on the ceiling the beautiful pattern of light and texture that shows off of the ceiling from this. Here's a great version, picture of our blossom glass. Lastly, lastly, we also do outdoor. So now you have the availability to do artisanal glass in an outdoor fixture. So that is a mouth-blown piece of glass, blown into a mold, just like one of these. Obviously, it's bigger than this. But that glass has the same chill marks on it. And that on an outdoor fixture, especially if you have a house that doesn't have a lot going on, if it's a smooth stucco home, or there's no brick, or there's very little trim on it, the pattern that's, that it'll throw on just a, on a plain wall is really beautiful and really adds a lot to the, to the drama of the architecture of the house. So questions about glass lighting. First of all, there are very few manufacturers of lighting that can do anything truly custom. Um, but you should, ask your, your, you should ask your client what they're looking for. Do they want something contemporary? Are they looking for something more traditional? Do they even like glass? You know, questions that you can kind of pull into the equation will really help you make the right selection or even give them options as far as what are the best things for them for their particular project. Um, size, color, those don't really need to limit your, your imagination. When it comes to doing custom stuff, we can do a blue piece of glass. This is the exact, this is the next size up, but this is a medium piece of glass. Um, this is done differently than how, if you think about Murano glass, which I've always been a fan of the glass from Italy. When you go to Murano, if you go into a, tra a traditional glass factory over there, what you'll see are multiple furnaces that have multiple colors of glass. And so they're having to make up batches of each color every single day. So they'll be red, they'll be blue, they'll be green, they'll be yellow, whatever the case may be, white, whatever the case may be. And the artisans can then take those colors and work within the, the confines of that. What we have the ability to do is take one single piece of glass and make a color out of it. So there is now frit that comes in a powder and it looks almost like an Alka-Seltzer tablet. So when the artisan draws out that first piece of glass to blow into his tube, he simply touches the end of that and then that color works it all the way through that one piece of glass. So the cool thing about that is, is that you can do custom color and it's not a gigantic cost increase. Um, when you talk about manufacturers of lighting that do glass, there are very few in this country. Um, there are a handful of 
artisan glass guys that I follow a bunch of people on Instagram, they might sell 10 fixtures a year. You know, their, their primary customer is, is a designer that's looking for something custom. There are very few what I would call small batch manufacturers that can do true custom when it comes to shape, size, and things like that. Where you will run into the biggest cost is in the size of the mold. Uh, this is another piece of glass that through the years I've gotten a lot of strange requests for. But I had a design firm that wanted to make this about the size of a soccer ball. Now, can we do that? It's very easy to do. We make our own molds, and so that's no problem. However, the mold to make two soccer ball pieces of glass was about a $20,000 investment. So now you divide that by two fixtures, now you're talking about a really expensive opportunity. However, if it was a commercial job where they were using 50 or 100 pieces of glass, that mold cost then can be absorbed and it's not quite that bad. But if it's simply color, that's really easy to do. Um, there are not very many places that you can kind of come up in your own mind with what's, what you think would be really cool and give somebody an opportunity to do it. I love it when you have a customer that's really looking for something unique. I think it's fun to expound, expand on the boundaries of, of what's available. So as a designer or as a, a sales associate working with a design firm, don't just think what you see is all you get, because there are a lot of opportunities out there, and custom really gives you a lot, of, a lot of opportunities. I went through that really fast. I think that's the fastest I've ever done that. But uh, I just I want to let you know that this is something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, the glass that we do internally at Hammerton, I just I, I can't be more proud of what they do. Um, I just got to travel with the man who started our company originally. He's now head overhead of all all design of both both of our divisions, and some of the stuff that they're working on right now is just absolutely stunning. Uh, in addition to cast glass, what we're working on right now, I call it candy glass. Um, if any of you, some of you are probably old enough like me to remember, but when you watched people pulling taffy back in the day. They're actually taking clear glass and the artisans are working together pulling it. We just had a piece of glass that he traveled with me last couple weeks ago. It was in the shape of a bull's horn. Um, there's all kinds of things that, that you can come up with. But uh, glass really is one of the more unique things that, that there is in, in the world of design. You're seeing more designers specifying their own product now instead of just opening the catalog and finding something in there. So with that, I'd really like to open up the floor to questions. Anybody have any questions about, about either glass or lighting? Anybody? I'm going to ask, what's your favorite custom piece that you've done? <sighs> so I would say my favorite, probably, there's a house that we did up in Vero Beach that Literally every single fixture in this house was a custom fixture. Um, the designer and the homeowner, the wife, sat down and they went through the Hammerton catalog and every single fixture they decided needed to be bigger or a different color. And I've always, I've always been a proponent of bigger is always better. So this particular house, I would say as a whole, was probably one of my favorite projects just because they did so many unique things in it. Um, at the same time, I've seen some really cool things that were just little little tweaks of things. Um, the LBU up in Boca actually had a client that did several fixtures from us, that each one of them had just a really slight modification to it. And so those fixtures, like they did some bedside hanging lamps that were originally it was going to have a really big pan, and they went to a little pan, and they grouped the fixtures together. Those are the kind of things that, to me, are really fun. Um, a lot of times you get involved in projects and you kind of wonder you know, whether you'll ever see the light of day that they'll finally get to the end of the line. But we've got some interesting things that we've been working on. Over, I've got a house coming up that I think will be one of those things that we'll look back and say, wow, that's really cool. Um, they have a vaulted dome ceiling in this hallway and they're going to place individual fixtures, they're going to use the raindrop, which is this piece right here, which is another new type of blown glass for us, super heavy on the bottom. Um, this is a new, this is one of our more popular new families. We've got it on display over here. But instead of one giant canopy, we're going to have 13 individual two inch canopies. And then the wires are going to run about 50 feet to another room in the house 
where the electrician in this house is putting all of the power supplies for anything that's low voltage all in one room. So that's going to be pretty cool. I think it'll be neat to see that set up too. Any other questions? On most of our stuff, if it's not too custom, we're around 10 to 12 weeks. Custom right now is running probably 14 to 16 weeks. It's usually not that bad. Um, part of the process that holds up custom is, is the back and forth, making sure we're all on the same page, that the specifications have been signed off and agreed upon and all of that. That usually takes some time. But our turnaround time usually most of the time is around 10 weeks on, on a, for anything else. What do you see as the biggest thing that will hold up the specification, like for the paperwork standpoint of it? Um, just really making sure that the sizes are correct, one. Number two, the finishes are correct. Um, in the case of this job I'm talking about in Orlando, it wasn't just the lighting fixture that we had to sign off on. We actually had to design and manufacture a wiring box for these to fit in. So we are manufacturing just, basically it's, it looks like a miniature recess lighting fixture with a plate on the bottom that's the canopy. Uh, we've never made that ever before, so this is the first time on a job. When I got the price back, I thought, hmm, <laughs> wow, I love custom stuff. And they signed off on it anyway, so we're all good. But those are the kind of things that really are, are really fun, because when you start getting into some of this really unique custom stuff, you, you find that what you typically would do with a normal lighting fixture, you have to go in a whole different direction to, to make it work. What about being on, like, the ocean and things like that? So, Internally, all of, all of our lighting fixtures from Hammerton, for the most part, have a lifetime finish warranty on them. Our outdoor fixtures do. I've been their rep for eight years. I have never replaced an outdoor fixture due to finish, not one time. Never, not once. Matter of fact, the only phone calls I've ever received about a quote unquote defective fixture, when I showed up at the job site, the electricians had installed the fixtures upside down and they filled up with water, but the finish held up. So they had to replace all the electrical components, but the finish held up great on the outside. Even indoors, um, we do have finishes that we give a really strong finish warranty on. So uh, I, I think that it's the metal part of the fixture is obviously you know, the, the weak link, if you will. Glass, nothing will really ever happen to the glass. So any other questions? I have seen fixtures from our company that by the time you add all these multiple pieces of glass to it, they can weigh as much as, I had one recently weighed 795 pounds. So that is another thing that on this, when you're on the, on the specification side of it, everybody kind of really needs to be on the same page knowing what's going to be involved in that. Normally obviously with something like that there's going to be some form of bracing that's going to need to be done up in the ceiling. Yeah. Another thing that you're seeing, I see a lot and I, sometimes I just really shake my head as to why they have to do this but uh, I see a lot of custom homes where they're using light lifts but they're using light lifts on fixtures that have long cords and there's like 15 fixtures hanging off of one pan I, it kind of defeats the purpose the glass is hanging down pretty much low enough you could reach it anyway um, but to do that you have to completely remanufacture the top of the fixture because the weight is now being held from the top instead of the bottom of the fixture so that requires a tremendous amount of engineering in there. And that also would ties back into the whole thing when it comes to custom. Um, I had this happen recently. We had a house down in the Keys where they ordered two giant 32 inch round pans. There were 15 lights on each fixture. The fixtures weighed around 450 pounds. Well, when they got to the job site, I get a phone call from the contractor. He says, hey man, I got a problem. I said, what's that? He says, well, we got light lifts here. I said, well, you do have a problem. <laughs> they just waited like 15 weeks for their fixtures to show up. I said, we do have a problem. I said, do you know what light lift you have? He says, I don't. I said, do you need to tell me that before we go any farther? Well, come to find out the light lift they had would only hold 300 pounds. So the first thing they had to do is remove the existing light lifts and install new ones that could handle up to 700 pounds. Then the second thing was, I said, we're going to have to remanufacture the canopy of the ceiling to, to go up to the ceiling. It was on a vaulted ceiling, so now it has to be suspended from cables and then hung. So this couldn't have been much more complicated. So I said to the, to the job superintendent, I said, look, we need to just make these fixtures from scratch. He says, I don't have time for that. Isn't there any other option? I said, let me check. So I got a hold of our, our engineering team. 
they came up with an opportunity to where they could basically make a bridge that would mount to the top of the fixture and that would then suspend the fixture from three cables to a single canopy. We can do that. I said, well, can you give me a quote on it, please? So I get a price back. It was going to be $9,000 and they have two fixtures. And the fixtures were already like $19,000 to start off with. So I'm dreading this phone call and I said, look, I got good news. We can do this. They can do this, this, and this. I said, there's just one little slight drawback. He says, what's that? I said, it's $9,500 a piece. And the only question he asked me was, how fast can you get those to me? So that worked out OK. And the fixtures look amazing now. But really, you know, when you're work there are very, once again, I keep saying there are very few companies that do this, but there really are. You know, when you work with a traditional lighting manufacturer, their limitations to custom are, are for the most part, pretty small. Um, with a company like Hammerton, not only can we blow beautiful decorative glass for you, but we can make an incredible frame that will fit on and it will go really in, in, in any application. Any other questions? Is there like a level, like what's the most expensive process of making glass and what's the expensive? Any automated process. So if it's some form of an automated, like when we talked about beer bottles and things like that, those are really inexpensive. Um, I was in charge of product development for a major U.S. manufacturer of lighting for three years. And when we would go to China and work in the factories, we would come up with the designs for our chandeliers. We were always looking for, for glass. Everything that you find over there is machine made. It's all blown into a mold. The glass is a little bit thicker than a piece of paper, but not much. Um, and then when you go the other way, uh, like a, a, a piece of glass, a cast glass piece like this really isn't that expensive to manufacture. But one of the things that we learned the hard way about this is the annealing process for this takes forever. This glass has to stay in an annealing oven for five days. Three years ago when we launched this family, it came out in June and then in October of that year we introduced five or six new versions of this glass. Sales skyrocketed. I mean, just absolutely took off. And we had a problem. We didn't know that we had a problem. Once we blew like 50 pieces of glass, we had to wait five days until we could blow 50 more. So we had to completely re-engineer the annealing ovens in our factory based around this glass. Because this is by far takes longer than anything we've ever done before to actually cool down. It, yeah, it's just so thick. I mean, this is actually two inches, a uh, two inch by 12, 14 inch piece of nothing but thick glass. Where normally you've got, you know, something like that, or, or, the, or the thickness of those pieces of glass right there. Those are hours for the most part. I mean, even a big gem like that probably would be in an annealing oven no more than six to eight hours, I don't think. But this really limited our production for months and months and months until we finally figured it out. But from an actual cost standpoint, really true artisan glass, blown artisan glass, what requires the artist the most amount of time, because they do get paid by the hour. And I, I don't think it's uh, somebody that used to be a server in a restaurant that's now blown glass for us. So they've had to spend a lot of time learning their craft, and they're very, very well paid for what they do. But to your point, I think just the traditional blowing of the glass in custom shapes and sizes is what would take the longest and be most expensive. Yes, sir? Which one? You mean this piece of glass? Yeah. So this glass typically will have an LED behind the end of it. Part? This one? This is just a cut off piece of that. So this is the fitter that would actually attach to the lighting fixture. So if this was a wall sconce, this would fit into a fitter and there would be an LED, a piece of LED light right underneath here that shines the light right through that. Uh, another thing, this is the size that it is because the, we use Cree LED chips, which are from the United States. They took the time to figure out how long that piece of glass could be and still be evenly diffused all the way through. One of the things you'll notice with this fixture lit up is it really does do a really nice job of lighting all the way through. Um, I had a lot of opportunities over the last couple years where designers wanted a longer version of this piece of glass. You wouldn't get any light out of the end of it. So when we had opportunities like that, what we would do is do a double so two with a piece in the middle and light going up and down. 
Or in one case, I actually did a fixture where we had, I think there were four pieces of glass all in a row, but each one had a coupler between to, to get light through both sides. Yeah, that we have that on display over there. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank all you people from LBU for allowing me to come in and talk about glass and nonsense and things like that. I'm always happy to do that. But I appreciate your support. And for you folks that are here filming this, thank you so much. This has been a really great opportunity. Um, I will give all of you my information if there's ever anything I can do to help you with glass on projects or whatever. I did bring some interesting catalogs for you. So here's the, some of the newest Hammerton books right here. If anybody wants to take any of those, you're welcome to. In the meantime, I think we got food over there. There's a little drink over there too. So if there's not any other questions, I'll, I'll just shut up. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. John, I just want to take a moment to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing presentation thank you. Um, for Tori and the entire LBU showroom. This is a beautiful showroom. Everyone saw that from the video, but also just thank you everybody for being here. Our special guests who came to view this in person. And for all of you to get all the Hammerton information, you can visit your local LBU showroom or visit them online at lbulighting.com. But for anybody that has not submitted their IDCEC number, um, you can email Andrea Williams at lbugroup.com. Um, we dropped it in the chat. So thank you again for visiting us tonight. And thank you again, John. Thank you. Absolutely. All right.